It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It is the Jill on Money show. We are delighted that you are joining us. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. We're broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios, Capital One. This is Banking Reimagined. What's in your wallet? Big weekend, Mark. Big, big, big weekend because we got Halloween and daylight savings ready to fall back an hour. I don't really care about the clock changing thing. It just seems like a a waste of time in general, but it doesn't bother me one way or the other. The Halloween thing, Mark, were you into Halloween as a kid? I wasn't either. Neither of us. I didn't. I never really got it. I just wasn't. I really was not into it. Um, not in like a mean er- way. I wasn't a hater. I just didn't quite. I don't know. I didn't find the joy in it all. Uh, I did dress up as Tom Seaver for a bunch of years. That was my big uni- my big Halloween uniform. <laughs> my that was I, I until I grew a little bit and grew out of the actual uniform. Anyway. Not a big Halloween fan. Also, cannot stand candy corns. Think they're the most vile, horrible candy ever. I don't get those either. Okay, let's move on from Halloween because obviously I'm not a, a, you know, though these days Halloween's great because I would just get like Halloween cookies for all of my neighbors. That's what I do for their kids. They're delish. Okay, if you have a financial question or a Halloween, something that you want to share with us, maybe you dress your dog up for Halloween Take a picture of it and send it to us. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll put it in the furry fan club. And if you have a question about what's going on in your financial life, then just send us an email as well. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Okay, so Jerry writes, what to do with money from a home sale? That's the subject line. And he says, we're in the process of selling our lifetime home. We are 70 years old and we're going to be moving to our lake home. Congratulations. That's so nice. My question, what would be or where would be a good place to invest our money from the long time home? It's approximately $750,000. Thank you for your time and suggestion. Well, Jerry, gosh, darn it. I need more information. I know you hate when I say that, guys, when you're listening, but Let me explain why I need that information. Let's say that this is all the money that Jerry and his wife have, and this is it. And it's 750 and they're 70 years old and they've got to live off of the income from this home. And that's one scenario. But what if alternatively, Jerry has a pension. Jerry's wife has a pension. They collect social security. They live on all their money. They don't need the $750,000. Well, then they could invest. They almost would be investing for a next generation or a charity or whatever. So without the information of what does this money represent to you? Is it part of your retirement savings? Do you need to draw down on it? What other assets do you have? Do you have children? Do you have charitable wishes? What else is going on? I'm flying blind without that information, gang. I'm sorry. I mean, I, it's sort of like you go to a doctor and you say, Doc, how do I, how, 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 how am I doing? And I look at your tongue and then that's it. I need more info. Got to take your blood pressure. Got to take your pulse. Got to do some blood work. I got to do a lot of stuff. So do me a favor. When you get a chance, follow up, send us that information, and we will absolutely help you out. Okay? Susan writes, her subject is debt nearing retirement. And she says, I listen to you weekly. I love your show. I'm embarrassed to say it's taken a long time to learn to be financially responsible. Don't be embarrassed to say that, by the way. It's okay. You're you're there. We, We can't go to the past. Let's go to the future. So let's keep going. Susan is 58, turning 59. She's got $60,000 in credit card debt. After making terrible choices and putting my children through college, paying with credit cards. What? 
Okay. The next sentence is where I'm saying what? Okay. Yes. $60,000 in credit card is terrible. Um, I have $1 million saved for retirement. It has annuities, Roth IRA, and IRA, traditional IRA. $75,000 in liquidity. I know this seems ridiculous, but I honestly don't know what to do with this debt. Do I just take my Roth money and pay the debt off? But that would take all of it. Tell me what to do. I have no one to talk to about this. Thank you. Mark, would you like to make your um, choice here about what to do? Get rid of it. Take the money out of the Roth. Too bad. You're done. Goodbye. Goodbye to Roth. Take that money out. And I hope you've had that money for in there for five years because there's a rule about that. But pay that off. And don't look back. But please, if you wouldn't mind, do not get into this same situation. You've got to be careful. I know it doesn't sound like you will, but my God, we want to avoid that. Get rid of it. Get back in touch with us. We'll hold your hand through anything else. Mark writes, hey, Jill, I love your show. I've since shared your podcast with a bunch of my other 24 to 30 year old friends. By the way, just one moment here. You're listening to a radio show. We have a podcast as well. We have a daily podcast called Jill on Money, and you can get that podcast any way, anywhere you find other podcasts. So that could be Apple and it could be Spotify. It could be whatever. I don't care. Wherever you get podcasts. If you don't know how to get a podcast, have one of your 24 to 30 year old kids, friends, nieces, nephews show you how to do it. Okay. Let's go back to the question at hand from Mark. So he shared the podcast with a lot of 24 to 30 year old friends. We love picking up valuable nuggets of information every day. One common question point of feedback I get is how often the examples are just not relatable to our generation, half a million in savings, multiple homes, three retirement accounts, pensions. My question is around your recommendation on balance of budget for a 24 to 30 year old and what constitutes financial success. I can provide a snapshot of myself as an example with the understanding mine might be slightly more advantageous than my peers due to not having college debt. Um, okay, so we're going to come back to this. Let's get, come back to the millennials, uh, 24 to 30 year olds, their questions, their concerns. You know, one of the reasons why sometimes we don't have as many of the young people is that we have had this radio show for a decade before the podcast ever started. So we have a whole listenership of somewhat older folks who've been with us for a longer time. But we want, we love young people. We love old people. We love rich people. We love poor people. We don't care. So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about how you might measure your success as someone just starting out. And by the way, this person's 24 or 30 years old. It, it could be someone who maybe went through a really crap time in their adult life and they're starting over at age 50. The advice will still be the same. I promise you. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you have a moment, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. And there you can subscribe to the podcast. It's so easy. Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and this is the program that attempts to take the mystery out of your financial life. If you have a question that's bubbling up, why don't you give us a holler? It's very easy to get in touch with us. All you have to do is send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Or conversely, you might be on our website, which is conveniently called jillonmoney.com. And when you're on the website, you will see that there is a contact button. It's usually in the upper right-hand corner. 
Um, now, someone uh, said to me that they, you know, this is what happened. It was funny. Mark, remember I told you that somebody had told me that on the website, the read, listen, watch went away. And I thought it was just because it was on their phone. It happens on my laptop also. When I when I put it on the bigger screen, when I put it up onto my monitor, the tabs are there. But when it's uh, just on my plain old uh, laptop, Sometimes if I, maybe, uh, maybe it's because the, if you make the font bigger, it can go away. So I just point that out to people to know that if you happen to like to pump up your font and those tabs go away, sometimes it makes the contact button go away. But even if it were to go away, there are those lines over on the right-hand corner. That'll help you out, especially if you're um, looking at the website on your phone. See, Mark, I, I'm really a, a technological genius. Okay, we're going to go back to a question that we got from a younger listener named Mark. He kind of basically wants to know, you know, what constitutes financial success? It's such an interesting question um, because... I think financial success to me means that you are, have done some planning, set some goals, established those goals, and you're on the path to achieving those goals. But it's so weird because those goals are different for every person. So your success, I, I mean, it could, it's going to be different for everyone. So I'm going to encourage you and all of your 24 to 30 year old friends to send me emails and give me their situations. You're going to give me yours. We're going to go through it. But I want to walk you through what success might mean for you. And that way you guys can, I want to hear more of your voices. Call up. We're doing calls now, gang. So, you know, let's get you going. So now let's get into the meat of it with Mark. Mark says, I'm 27 years old. I'm single. I earn $90,000. I've got $1,600 a month in fixed expenses. I contribute about $15,000 to my 401k, 10% Roth, the rest into the regular. Only debt is credit card debt that's, pulled off, that's paid off in full every month. Okay. Investments, $50,000 in Robinhood, mostly stocks, twenty dollars in free cash, 60,000 Capital One Aggressive Path Company Retirement Plan, twelve dollars to $15,000 in emergency savings. Okay, so here are the questions. What do you recommend a young single person like me do saving, does for savings? So we're taught save, save, save. Life is short. We want to enjoy ourselves. Do you have a best practice as far as percentage of post-tax income to spend versus save? Conversely, comparing ourselves to our peers is unhealthy, but there must be success stories to follow. So what are good benchmarks for total wealth at age 25, 30, and 35? You know, I always hate that question because if you make, I mean, you make $90,000, but what if I compared you with uh, somebody who is a teacher who's 25 years old and makes $28,000? Can't even compare total wealth. So here's how I look at it. I would say, first of all, you're in great shape. Let me start with like big, you know, gold medal for you. I think that it's fantastic because um, you're putting money into retirement. That's great. We love for 20 somethings to start early. I would really prefer that you max out your retirement contributions. So in, in my mind, instead of 15,000 annually, you would get to the 19,500. So um, I'm, I wonder, I'm not sure exactly about the 401k for you um, or whether maybe there's a match, but you can put $19,500 a year away into retirement. And that's what I would do. And the combination with a Roth or with a traditional, I don't care, but let's get to 19,500. That would be number one. Because that's really efficient savings, especially the Roth, considering that we believe, at least we here at Jill on Money, believe that taxes are probably going to be higher. So let's try to get as much money as possible into the Roth and make that a tax efficient account. The second aspect of this is that um, once you've done that, you have your emergency reserve fund, you have no debt, you're maxing out. So now you can do other stuff. So you can do your Robin Hood, you can do your 
um, you know, you've got your your emergency reserve, your Robin Hood, and you can even start doing more into Robin Hood once you've maxed out your retirement account. Beyond that, if you're doing all that, then spend, go crazy. I have no problem with people who want to spend money. I actually think it's sort of healthy to say that you can do a little bit of everything. You shouldn't save to the extreme unless you have some, I don't know, you know, that's the 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 fire movement, right? Financial independence, retire early. It's, you know, basically live like a pauper, save a ton of money and have choices later. But um, I think that you're in really good shape. And if you run your retirement numbers, you're going to find that you're in good shape. I, I, I think that there's not a lot to um, make me look at this situation and say, oh, my God, there's something wrong here. It looks great. It totally looks great. All right. A uh, couple things that are changing next year. I got a friendly reminder from the IRS that uh, there is uh, some you know, there's some different brackets, some inflation adjustments. You'll see that um, single taxpayers who have a workplace retirement plan, there's new phase out ranges. I mean, they are teeny tiny changes, but they're changes. So just know that same goes with um, income phase out range for people who are using a Roth IRA. So if you uh, for next year, this is for 2021, the income phase out range for for you, 125 to 140,000 for singles. It's up by a thousand bucks. And for married, uh, you know, it, it moves up by a couple thousand. So you get phased out. If you're married, you cannot make a contribution to a Roth IRA if you make 198,000 to 208,000. So all that stuff, um, uh, is changed just slightly, but the limit on contributions to 401ks, still 19,500, 6,500 if you're over 50. Simple IRAs unchanged, 13,500. And the IRA contribution remains unchanged, 6,000 with an extra thousand if you're over the age of 50. I mean, Inflation's low. They're not going to change a lot of these things. I mean, unfortunately, that's that's just kind of where we are. So I, I point that out to you just to give you the uh, the 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 head the heads up that things are uh, afoot and changing at the IRS just a bit. Uh, Stephanie writes they want to refinance their their house and they've got credit a uh, credit score of seven sixty. We've got some debt on cards. My question, is it ideal to spread money out across cards this month in order to get the totals down to below or closer to 30% or is the effect not great enough and am I better off continuing to pay minimums and to pay down the card with the highest APR? I have have a lot of questions about this. Um, Are you refinancing your house and taking all the money and taking some money out to pay off this debt? In that case, you know, you, you can kind of own that and tell the people who are you're refinancing with that you plan to do that. Um, I don't think it's going to make a difference in the near term, but you should ask your mortgage broker, get the information there. But uh, like credit card debt, guys, come on. It's enough. You're listening to Jill on Money. When we return more of your questions during the break, why don't you hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com, and there you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money Halloween weekend. Boo! (laughs) You'll have to go to the website and listen to the first um, opening part of this show, the first segment, to hear my opinion about Halloween. Um, but I won't, I will not repeat myself, but happy Halloween to everybody. And, uh, for those of you who are not that into Halloween, aren't you happy? You don't have to be that into Halloween this year, right? 
Okay. Uh, This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And we would love to have you give us a holler via email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Tell us what's going on. Also tell us whether or not you might be interested in coming on the air with us. Mark has been just fantastic getting everybody together who is trying to come on the air with us. And it's really nice for me to hear your voices Today, we have Miss Ruby, who is on the line. Ruby, welcome to Jill on Money. Thanks for coming on. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So what's going on in your financial life? How can we help you out? Um, Well, I'm a federal employee, still employed, and I recently got a promotion. So I will be starting to hit that Roth IRA limit. And fortunately, unfortunately, I had a good local county job. So I have a rollover IRA already with Vanguard. Okay. How is that? Wait a second. So you've got a rollover account. How much is in the rollover account? In the rollover account right now, it was $130,000. Okay. And how much do you have in your current retirement account? So as a federal employee, I have access to the TSP. Mm -hmm. Um, It's $170,000. And it's kind of split between the Roth TSP and the traditional TSP. Oh, so you have a little bit of both. That's fantastic. Okay. Tell me more. What else is going on? Um, I'm single, no kids. I'm deployed overseas. So while I do have a primary residence and a small condo, I have renters in there that are paying the mortgage. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. So how can we help you out? What's the question here? Um, The question that I have is that, Um, I understand that I'm going to be up at that limit for even contributing to a Roth IRA outside of my TSP or the regular 401k. I read something about the pro rata rule because I have this traditional rollover IRA that's out there. So sure, should I start trying to convert that or should I dump it into the TSP? I know some people love the TSP because it's low fees, but I like Vanguard where it's at because there's lots of options. Well, wait a second. You said 106,000. The Roth IRA phase out limit is for a single person is $124,000. Yeah. Due to my assignment overseas, I'm, I'm going to hit that. <laughs> oh, I see. Cause you probably get a housing credit or something and that's taxable. Is that how it works? Um, uh, due to the location where I'm at, they pay us for being in hard places. I gotcha. Okay. Uh, how are you investing the rollover? When you say you got Vanguard funds, is it all index funds or what do you got in there? I would say half of it is in a target fund and the other half of it, because I'm trying to be aggressive, is sort of in their total stock market fund, mutual okay. fund. Okay. I mean, but the TSP, don't you have an index fund option inside of the TSP? Yeah, they're very generic. I mean, they use letters like C, S. And I for common stock international. So yeah, but I mean, in other words, in other words, is I I guess that I had thought that there's just a plain old index fund, and wouldn't your index fund in Vanguard be exactly the same as the index fund in the TSP or not? Yes, but they also in the Vanguard there's RITs that I can choose. And I see you like you like a little flexibility. Yes, and they're quicker. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay. So now I guess the question is, what do we do with this, this 130 grand rollover? Well, okay. So a couple of things to consider. You could leave it where it is and just keep using it. That's fine. I think that it is uh, certainly feasible for you to consider a Roth conversion. My question is, do you have money outside of the traditional or Roth accounts that you have to pay the tax that would be due on a conversion? Um, I have about 15 grand in emergency funds and like 10 grand I could play with. So right now, I think that doing a conversion a little bit at a time is completely fine. You know, you're in the you know, you're in the 24% tax bracket. So why not convert as much of the rollover that would allow you to pay whatever taxes do out of that extra money? I don't think you should use your emergency reserve fund, but it sounds like you kind of build up your savings pretty quickly. So why don't you just slowly but surely over the next couple of years, do the conversion. And then, yeah, I mean, once you 
essentially get that part converted, you could potentially do backdoor Roths. Now, obviously, the quicker way to do it is to just roll over the whole Vanguard IRA into the thrift savings plan. And then you immediately start doing backdoor Roths. But you said you really like your Vanguard flexibility. So I don't want to take your flexibility away from you. You can certainly start right now and say that you could convert as much as you can pay the tax on. That's it, though. Don't go beyond that. All right. I wasn't sure on your, someone's like, roll everything over. It's the lowest fees ever. And I'm like, but it's also locking it up in a box that's very bland. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, like I'm super bland myself, so I don't really mind that. But I guess that part of me feels like if you like that flexibility, you can always kind of fill in the blanks of what's missing from the TSP options and use your Vanguard account to fill those spaces in. So I guess what I also would say is this, I'm not sure I'd use a target date fund in that rollover account at all. In fact, I would probably use the kinds of funds that you don't have in your thrift savings plan to round out your allocation. But if you really want to use the optionality of the Vanguard funds, then use them. The target date fund is like, doesn't make sense to me for you. I think you could bring in other asset classes that are much more interesting than take advantage of why you have that money there, which is Vanguard has a zillion index funds, so many different asset classes, and they're really cheap. So that's what I would do. Awesome. All right. This helps a lot to get myself ready for what's coming next. Fantastic. Hey, listen, thanks for giving us a shout and good luck overseas. And please be careful because it doesn't sound like you get paid that much money for being in an unsafe place. So be careful. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jill. You're listening to Jill on Money. Hey, go to the website, jillonmoney.com. And there you can sign up for the newsletter. You can subscribe to the podcast. You can buy my book. But more importantly, check out the resource section. Mark has filled it with all sorts of valuable information. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are so happy you've joined us today. Don't forget about the whole clock thing. Thank goodness all this stuff is automatic, uh, you know, for most of our devices. But, you know, there's always that moment where you wake up and you look at your microwave. You're like, oh, my God, what time is it? So don't forget. Fall back. Do give us a holler. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And if it's anything on your mind that has a dollar sign associated with it. And this is uh, one of those emails that I always am worried about reading because the subject is I'm scared. And here's how it goes. Hi, Jill. My name is Mark. I listen to your daily podcast three to four times a week. You guys are awesome. I've learned a lot over the last couple of years. I actually used to watch and listen to the 404 show with Jeff and the guys a few years ago. It was honestly sad to see that. And that was a CNET show. Loved that show. Uh, anyways, this is the first time I'm writing to you and Mark. I'm 45 years old in the Bay Area, Oakland. Marriage is coming to an end after a year. Too much to go into. Oh, that's so sad. And now just lost my $85,000 a year full-time job. I make about a third of that now working 30 hours a week. I'm looking for another full-time job in the architecture field. I'll probably scale the current job to a couple hours at night. I have a little over $19,000 in a 401k that I'm going to roll over from Schwab to John Hancock really soon. Why? Do not roll that over until we have some more information. I don't know why you would go over to John Hancock. I don't think that's a great idea. He goes on to write, I have about $1,800 in stash, very little saved, a little over $80,000 in school loans, outstanding child support, no credit card debt, about 400. Well, I think he means he's got $400 in credit card debt. Okay. But he's got some big obligations and he's lost a lot of income. So that's the big issue that he went from making eighty five thousand dollars and, you know, to probably making he'll end up making thirty five, maybe forty thousand if he grits it out a little bit. 
He says, I'm scared because when I listen to your show, I hear m- people have much more saved with retirement and multiple class. I'm a classic case of payment comes in, it goes to bills, and I have next to nothing to show for it at the end of a couple of weeks. I'm here in Oakland, and quite honestly, I can't take it anymore. The cost of living has drained me. This is a terrible story. So let's think about this. So he says, I have a couple of entrepreneurial ideas. And I love all of them, but I'm scared of where I and my, I guess, soon-to-be ex will be in 15 to 20 years. The more I listen to your show, the more of a chasm I see between where I am financially and most of your listeners. Do you have any advice or a direction where I can go? I know it's a broad question. Thank you for taking the time to read this. Truly appreciative, Mark. Well, Mark, first of all, boy, this sucks. I'm so sorry because it does suck. And I like the idea that you have entrepreneurial ideas, but I think the reality of where you are right now is that we've got to get you locked down and in a place where you can essentially really float where you are. Now, although I'm going to hate myself for saying this, I would like you to potentially consider whether you may want to let tap some of that 401k money, because um, I want to know how much money is, you know, is that, is that 401k going to be halved because of child support or um, because of a divorce? I know that you, you don't have a ton of money in there, but you know, maybe if you had some of that money available to you, it would give you some peace of mind. And I, I presume that you lost your, your full-time job because of coronavirus. And that means that you will not be penalized for taking an early distribution from your retirement account. So what you probably should do is first and foremost, take the old 401k from Schwab and just do not roll it to John Hancock, roll it over to an IRA rollover account at Schwab. Then you probably should consider whether you want to take some of this money and at least, you know, clear up your credit card debt and put a little bit of extra money in the bank so you have it or put some of this money in money market accounts so you have it available if you need it. The thing about the coronavirus retirement distribution is that if you pull money out of this account, the tax that would be, there's no penalty, but the tax that would be due could be spread evenly over three years. And that could be something that would be very helpful to get you through this crap period. The other piece of this would be the school loans. Could you refinance those loans? Are you in forbearance? Are they um, through the federal government or are they private? You know, what I can tell you is that when the blank hits the fan, you really focus on the most important thing. And right now you're doing what you should be doing, which is hustling to get a job, making sure that you keep your bills going, but notifying all of the folks that you owe money to that you have lost your job because of COVID and see if you can negotiate some room. You didn't mention any unemployment. So we're wondering, did you not file for unemployment? That would be something that obviously you should get. Okay, give us a holler if you need something else, because that's a crappy story. I'm really so sorry for you. All right, you're listening to Jill on Money. Give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is Banking Reimagined. What's in your wallet? We just went through a little technical snafu on our end, and it made me realize that despite my great love of the virtual studios, I do sometimes miss a physical studio. 
It's true, Mark. Really, I do. If you've got a financial question, a money question, uh, anything at all with a dollar sign, you're just getting started, getting trying to get back up on your feet after the virus knocked you down, give us a holler. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. This is from Janet, who wants to know how to know if you are working with a fiduciary. How do I know that someone's going to be acting legally and ethically on my behalf? So, by the way, uh, legally is not necessarily a fiduciary standard because there is no legal obligation that someone in financial services has to act as a fiduciary. But here's what it really gets down to. Fiduciary means that the financial professional with whom you're dealing is somebody who has said that they would act as a fiduciary, meaning they'll put your interest before their interest or before their firm's interest. People who are uh, certified as certified financial planners, CFPs, they now are having to comply with this rule at all times. They used to have to be, if you were a CFP, you had to say, oh, I'm a fiduciary when I'm doing planning, but other times not. But now CFP board change that all around and everyone has to act in the fiduciary standard at all times. So, you know, you're dealing with a fiduciary if someone is a CFP or if they're a member of NAPFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. But if you don't know, you can ask the person with whom you're working, hey, are you held to the fiduciary standard at all times? That's probably the easiest way to find out. There is unfortunately not one grand list of all fiduciaries, although that's a fantastic idea. So uh, if you want to go find the fiduciary, you can go to the CFP website, letsmakeaplan.org, or go to National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, napfa.org. All right. One more moment before we get to our special guest. Yep, it's a little bit of a politics talk at the economy and the election coming up next with special guest star Nathan Sheets. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's our number two of Jill on Money. And, well, you know, it is go time. I know most people have already decided who they're voting for. It's all right. We recorded this interview with an economist named Nathan Sheets uh, a few weeks ago, and it was uh, really good stuff. It was a great way to really delineate between the two candidates. So Nathan Sheets, uh, he is sort of a lifelong wonko, big time economist. He worked in the second Obama administration, but, you know, I think he probably pretty easily could have worked in a Bush administration as well. He has a pretty down the line technocratic approach to the economy. And uh, it was it was interesting to hear him kind of draw the distinctions, I guess, with the hindsight of, you know, having four years of an administration and also having uh, Biden serve as vice president to the Obama administration, you do get a sense of where they both come down in terms of the economy and policies, but things shift, you know, and it is interesting to to hear from Nathan Sheets how those shifts have started to shake out in what's happening today and and really how how he sees the future. That's what I would say. So if you've got a financial question, you have feedback on this. I got some hate mail about this uh, from lots of different people. Um, when I wrote about Nathan Sheets, that must mean that I'm doing something right if, if both sides get angry with me. So good for me. Good on me. Here's our interview with economist Nathan Sheets. I want to start first by getting a little bit of your bio here. You had a kind of a cool job in the last administration. What'd you do? So I was the undersecretary for international affairs at the U.S. Treasury, which means that I was uh, responsible for the international program of the Treasury, working with foreign counterparts, uh, building relationships, working in the G20, the IMF and uh, so forth, representing the United States around the world. 
before you took that job, were you political in nature? Was that like, oh, this is the coolest thing? And how'd you get involved in that? My roots, I think the best word I could use would be technocratic or, you know, pure economic analysis that I spent almost 20 years at the Federal Reserve, also in the international division, and then spent uh, a few years in the private sector uh, speaking to market participants. And in the process of uh, those other activities, I built relationships with a number of folks who were working at the Treasury. I think that's the, the nature of how I got there. And uh, why they reached out was, I think they were looking for somebody who understood the economy, understood markets, and understood how uh, international economic policy is constructed and put together. And now you are chief economist and head of global macroeconomic research at PGIM Fixed Income, which sounds to me like you decided you got to pay for your kid's college education after all this public service, right? Uh, I, I I have four kids and uh, <laughs> the college bills are substantial. <laughs> um, all right. So let's dive into this because although the economy is not taking center stage right this second in terms of the rhetoric between the the two campaigns. How would you characterize the difference between a second Trump administration and a Biden administration when it comes to their approach to economics? So I think the uh, philosophical differences really are significant. So for a Trump administration, I think it's put your foot on the accelerator and try to grow the economy. And I think that that is the stated rationale for the tax cuts that were put in place and the uh, efforts to deregulate the economy. I think for a Biden administration, it is very much a focus on how do we make the economy fairer? And in the process of making the economy fairer, what are the tools that we can use to also make it more efficient? And I think that's what leads to a push for increased infrastructure expenditure, increased education expenditure, a greater emphasis on the environment and uh, developing green technologies. But it is between these two candidates The philosophical divide on economic issues is very, very broad. Well, doesn't it go back to the age old question of do you believe in the supply side economics theory, which it seems to me, you know, observing the Trump administration, I mean, look, he probably doesn't believe in anything. So I'm just going to go out on a limb and say people in his administration believe on some level that cutting taxes helps to spur economic growth, an old theory called supply-side economics. Is that uh, fair to say about the way that they've conducted themselves in terms of pursuing this ideal of growth? I think uh, that is a very fair characterization of the gearing of policy. It really is an effort to generate jobs and generate investment. And I think that's what we saw in the tax cuts that were put into place in late 2017. And arguably in 2018, some of that was starting to get traction. But then another aspect of Trump's economic program is the trade wars. And just as the economy was starting to lift a bit as a result of those policies, it got hit with a big adverse development with the effect of the trade wars. I guess that I had sort of believed that this idea of supply side tax cut to get growth had been killed off. But what you're saying is actually there was some evidence that the economy was picking up. I had interviewed a couple of economists and they said, yes, you're going to get one decent year of growth and then we'll go back to trend. What does the research tell us about tax cuts and growth? So I would say that broadly speaking, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that tax cuts are going to generate additional growth. However, the counter to that is that the U.S. economy has been in a place where 
investment has been quite weak for an extended period of time. And uh, the narrative was, well, maybe lower corporate tax rates, particularly the lower corporate tax rates, might put firms in a position uh, where they would invest more. They'd have more money and they would invest more. And in 2018, we saw a little bit, nothing definitive or decisive. But then with the trade wars, that was slammed down. So we will never know really Mm. whether those tax cuts did what President Trump wanted. He cut short his experiment, so to speak, before it really had a chance to gain root. And certainly now we're back to a place of weak investment characterized by substantial macro uncertainties. We'll get back to Nathan Sheets in just a second. During the break, if you've got a question that's bubbling up because of what you've heard, why don't you just send us an email? Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com or head to the website JillOnMoney.com. We've got a contact button there. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are giving you the second hour devoted to the economy, and we're talking about the political and economic differences between the Trump and Biden campaigns. So in our first segment with economist Nathan Sheets, we talked about his own background, a little bit about President Trump. In this segment, we start to get into a discussion of how Nathan Sheets believes the Trump economy performed. But we did this in, I I think, a pretty smart way in, in, in listening to it again, and that is that we we divided it up, right? Because there was a delineation before the pandemic and since the pandemic, right? So before the pandemic, there was clearly a big push on tax cuts and deregulation. So in that sense, we have a lot of evidence of success in the Trump universe. So I think it's worthwhile saying that, you know, at least when we look at the record, we have numbers, we understand what the first three years of the Trump administration meant, and uh, we have a way to really grade it. Well, I don't because I'm not an economist, but Nathan Sheets, the economist, he has a way of grading it. And so then we'll talk a little bit in this section also about the economy amid the pandemic. So here is more of our interview with economist Nathan Sheets. If this raises your rankles and you need to shoot an email to us, just send it to askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay. Here's more of the interview with Nathan Sheets. I want to sort of divide this into the pre and current pandemic era. So we get the tax cut end of 2017, 2018, you get mostly corporations and rich people. Rich people obviously are saving their money because that's what rich people do. And the corporations, some of whom are very willing to make, you know, shell out a few bucks to do things, but mostly just increase their dividend payouts and reward their shareholders. Okay. Or buy their own stock. And now you get to 2019 and, you know, the trade wars are starting to light up a bit. And I guess what I'm interested in understanding is if you, if you objectively look at 2018 and 2019 coming into it, there were obviously some fissures in the two main theses that the Trump administration had not just sort of ascribed to, but enacted, right? So one is tax cuts lead to growth. And the second is we need a fairer relationship with China. And the way to get that relationship to be a fairer relationship is to enact this trade war, I guess. The other part of the Trump administration's policies, I guess, that you write about also has to do with regulatory issues. And so a lot of regulations have been watered down 
in the effort to, I guess, spur growth. And so if you put everything together, how do you grade the Trump administration in terms of 2017, 18, and 19, in terms of economic issues? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And let's say uh, through 19, maybe a B minus, it could have been a higher grade without the trade wars. But I really think that the trade wars and the broader uncertainty in the way we conducted international economic policy created a heavy restraint on the economy and particularly on the corporate sector. So I don't think we can do any better than B minus. Now, that said, in their defense, growth was at or a little bit above trend through those years. And the unemployment rate stayed low. It seems that it would be unfair to give them a grade weaker on the economy through that period than B minus. The question that's really interesting is whether the deregulation and some of the indicators that we were continuing to struggle with heavy inequality in our economy was in some sense creating problems on down the road for us in terms of social divisions, in terms of heavier debt levels that we're going to have to deal with in terms of a less efficient economy and a, and a dirtier environment that over time we'll also have to pay a price for. So let's move on then to the current pandemic, the health pandemic, and also the economic pandemic. And we're going to get to the whole Biden part. Don't worry, everyone listening is like jumping out of their skins. What about Biden? Okay, calm down. We'll get there. So Nathan, pandemic hits. Can you talk about why the Federal Reserve has been so hyper-focused on the economic and financial fallout of the pandemic on the country's financial situation? This pandemic saw an absolutely extraordinary decline in uh, U.S. GDP, which means spending, it means employment. Uh, during the first half of the year. And consistent with that, the economy lost roughly 22 million jobs and the unemployment rate soared. And so the Federal Reserve looks at this situation and says, what can we do to help provide support through this extraordinary time? And uh, there are a couple of different ways for them to do that. One is to directly address the economy, which they did primarily through cutting rates and uh, some asset purchases. But there is also a risk during those periods that if the financial markets collapse and become dysfunctional, that then is going to cascade back into even weaker spending, employment, production, and quality of life for U.S. citizens. So the Fed focuses on the markets, not for the sake of raising asset prices, but the Fed focuses on the markets from the standpoint of protecting the economy and protecting jobs. And the Federal Reserve Chair, Jay Powell, just continues to say the Fed has lending authority. It does not have spending authority. So coming into March, there clearly was this effort, a bipartisan effort to create this thing called the CARES Act. What is at stake with no further stimulus on the table right this moment? So the fiscal stimulus that has been put in place to date has been very effective in supporting unemployed workers, which have been primarily lower paid workers, and in addition, providing support to small business. And I think that what we will see in coming months, if we don't have additional fiscal stimulus, is that some of the unemployed households and other lower income households and small businesses are going to be hit and feel meaningful pain as a result of that. That means the growth in the economy is going to be slower. Consumption is going to be lower. The capacity of businesses to employ will be less as, as small businesses just don't have the resources. So I really see it as additional fiscal stimulus at this stage as being a critical part of supporting the recovery through the next three to six months. What would it mean 
right now for the economy if we do not see another package maybe until next year? Let's let's play forward. What would it look like to have no additional support until 2021? It means that U.S. real GDP growth in the fourth quarter will be appreciably lower, probably five or six percentage points lower than if we had additional fiscal stimulus. It, it means that the unemployment rate will not be declining as quickly, and the unemployment rate is going to stay higher for longer. So there are very direct and concrete implications of this for the next several quarters. The good news is that underneath all of that, there does seem to be a recovery process that's occurring in the United States. A additional fiscal would be a very helpful and I think essential tailwind to the recovery. We'll get back to economist Nathan Sheets in just a second. Hey, if you want to check out a little bit more of a long form of this interview, you can go to our website, jillonmoney.com, click on the read tab, and you'll see I have a blog post about the economy and the election. So check it out. It's at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life, your personal financial life. Sometimes we try to help you understand what's going on in the larger economy with some great guests. Today, we are joined by Nathan Sheets. He is an economist. He works in the private sector now, but he's worked in government for most of his life. And in this section of our interview, we're talking about stimulus. And when we had recorded this, I remember thinking, you know, Nathan and I got off the air and we talked pretty much about how, like, obviously there was going to be a stimulus before the election. Well, look at that. There's no stimulus. But I think this section of the interview still holds because uh, even after the election, I think it's pretty clear that the economy is going to need some help. And that help is going to come in the form of government spending. The way that the government spends money, how the government spends money, that's what we don't know. But I think that both sides will come to the table. It will happen. So in this section of our interview with Nathan Sheets, we're talking about stimulus. Were you in the Obama administration in the first term or in the second term or both? Uh, During the second term. Good, because I don't have to hang this on you then. I would say that in the first term, maybe one of the lessons learned from the housing crisis is that the government needed to do more for individuals, or at least as much as they did for individuals as they did for the stability of the financial system. I cannot quite wrap my brain around what is the roadblock here. As you said, you know, spending money before an election is usually a good idea. So anyone who's you know, kind of out there would say, and and maybe up for re-election, hey, I want this, right? But more to the point, there's a humanitarian aspect of it, but there's an economic aspect of it. I thought it was almost humorous to hear some of the lawmakers say, well, what about the debt and the deficit? Aren't we adding too much to the debt and the deficit? Can you respond to that in terms of a an economic headwind in the future? Talk about the ultimate kick the can down the road. Why is it smart to spend the money today, despite the fact that we are moving into pretty scary territory in terms of the numbers and the the amount of the national deficit and the national debt accruing at this pace? On the one hand here, let me be a two-handed economist. One of the great question marks of where we are today is how much scarring is there going to be in the economy as a result of this episode? And by scarring, I mean permanent effects of what is happening on economic performance and economic growth in the years ahead. And some of the areas where we might see scarring are amongst workers who have lost their jobs. These folks who aren't working, their skills are deteriorating. They may have a, find it more difficult to get a new position. Uh, Small firms that go out of business aren't going to be able to produce anymore, and that means the economy is weaker. 
corporate and uh, household balance sheets are stretched and hurting and will hurt more as this thing carries forward. So I think that the risk here is that we have more scarring if we don't have the fiscal stimulus, which translates directly into a less productive economy going forward and slower growth. But if you hear debt deficit as the rationale, what are your first thoughts or what's your response to that? I have uh, spent the last uh, six weeks or so looking at a lot of data on exactly this issue. And I would say that for the United States and other advanced economies, there's very little evidence, maybe no evidence, that higher debt levels are associated with higher inflation. So let's move into the the Biden agenda when it comes to the economy, because obviously one of the things that the pandemic has laid bare are the enormous inequalities that exist. So, you know, whether these are gender wage inequalities, racial inequalities, all these pieces come to a head almost with the pandemic. So talk about how that informs a Biden administration. I think it is the the motivating thought for a lot of the economic policies that we are in a place where the inequality is so pronounced that it is impeding and creating uh, headwinds for the growth of the economy. And specifically, over the last decade or so, the U.S. economy and the global economy have grown more slowly than before. We ask ourselves, what's going on? The problem is that there's not enough demand out there. There's just not enough money that people want to mobilize by spending. If you move some resources, and I think the pandemic has highlighted this, from top income earners to uh, folks in other parts of the income distribution, you create demand. Those higher income folks are likely to save that dollar. The lower income folks are likely to spend it. And so I think that the motivating thought is that inequality is feeding back and weighing on economic performance. It's weakening aggregate demand. And it's important for us to take steps to address that in ways that are conscious of the efficiency of the economy as well. Now, part and parcel to that is, and Biden has said this, and many have written about it, is that tax rates are likely to go higher under a Biden administration. Where do you think tax policy is going under a Biden administration? How how would you, you know, let's talk about the individuals first, that, you know, all of those tax cuts and the changes in brackets, I presume those are going higher. But where do you think the the real pain is going to be felt for tax rates? At what level? I think one framing thought here that's important is I would expect that the Biden administration will start with economic stimulus and then will turn to tax uh, increases once the economy is on a a stronger uh, footing. Now, the specifics of what I'd expect on the personal side is uh, Vice President Biden has indicated that no one making less than $400,000 a year will see higher taxes. So my expectation is that we would see Uh, higher taxes for higher earners, probably starting at that $400,000 benchmark, and then becoming uh, gradually more pronounced as incomes rise. Okay. When we return with economist Nathan Sheets, we're going to shift to what Joe Biden's record looks like on the economy and also talk about some of the things that he is proposing. Jill on Money, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com is our email address. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, 
And today, you know, the last weekend before the presidential election, we couldn't help it. We have recorded an interview with Nathan Sheets. He's an economist. And uh, he wrote a really interesting article in Barron's uh, about a month or so ago, maybe two months ago. Mark found it. We liked him and we wanted to get him on the air. And so in this part of the interview, we are focusing on Biden proposals for the economy and more specifically what a Biden administration would do in terms of taxes, because I think a lot of people operate under this assumption that, you know, everyone's taxes have to go up or down and what would happen. But Sheets really does believe that the the Biden policies would raise taxes for sure. It, it really would, but not necessarily for everyone. So here is more of our interview with Nathan Sheets. And if you've got a question or something comes up for you in listening to this, just send us an email. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Okay, here's more of our interview with Nathan Sheets. So right now, if you are married filing jointly and you are, uh, let's say you make more than $414,701, you're in the 35% tax bracket. And then there's the 37% tax bracket for um, households that make more than 622000 How high do you think these rates could go? I just heard an interview with Bill Gates where he's like, nah, you know, I think we could see certainly like go to 50% on a federal level and probably 70%, you know, for the billionaires. So do you think this country could handle that? I think that those numbers, those are very high numbers. And as you get that high, you need to be thinking carefully about how does that impact the incentive of folks to invest, to create businesses, to work, uh, and so forth. But I do think for the billionaires that there is going to be a uh, a meaningful increase in taxation. I don't have a firm view uh, as to how high it will go, but they could see four or five or six percent higher tax rates, I would say. Can we talk a little bit about capital gains? Can we have a conversation, a frank conversation? I'm just like I'm having a, a conversation about sex ed with an expert. Can we have a conversation about capital gains taxes? Why not treat long-term capital gains as we treat short-term capital gains? Thanks for asking this question. This is, this is a very important set of issues that I don't think is getting adequate attention. The received wisdom on this and why the tax code looks the way it does is that by having a lower tax rate for capital gains, particularly long-term capital gains, you're providing incentives for investors to put their money into businesses, into productive uses, and that that investment that results will help drive the economy and make the economy more efficient. That's the theory that has motivated that lower tax rate. Let, let's be honest. A lot of people listening to this are like freaking out right now. They're like, oh, my God. Oh my, but what's the difference? What choice do you have? Of course, you're going to put your money. Well, you're not going to invest. This seems in, insane to me. What your option is then just spend the money. Isn't so what? Like, yeah. what's the downside of having higher capital gains rates for the long term investor? The downside for the long term investor I would say it's just broadly that they're they're paying more taxes. But as you say, these folks will continue to invest. And we're in a place where, if anything, as I said, we have an excess of savings in the economy, particularly at that top end, and we need more, we need more demand. So back in the 80s, they were saying, oh, we need more savings. Right now, we need to find ways to stimulate more demand and to incentivize a little more consumption and a little less investment by having a somewhat higher capital gains rate seems to me, given our challenges as being justified, and uh, I'd say unlikely to impact critical investments that are actually going to drive growth. What about, let's turn to the corporate tax code, because we were, everybody sort of this had this mantra, oh, the U.S., 35%, it's terrible, it makes people throw their money in these weird shell accounting games outside of the country, even though they really weren't outside of the country, but okay. And now the corporate tax rate is at 21%, as a number of CEOs and C-suite folks told me, off the record, of course, Holy moly, we thought we were going to get 27, 28. We can't believe we're at 21. 
What happens to these corporate tax rates? I think corporate taxes under a Biden administration are likely to go up. I think the question is how much? Uh, Vice President Biden has indicated to 28 percent, which is what uh, the Obama-Biden administration had uh, advocated uh, some time ago. Whether they get all the way back up to 28 percent, I think is an open issue. Maybe it ends up landing a little less than that at 26 or 27. So I think they, they will rise. I do agree with you that it was critical that we get that corporate rate down to 35. Where the rate lands between 21 and 26 or 27 or 8, I think is less critical. But we also there need to think carefully as we raise corporate taxes about the incentives that it's creating for firms to hold resources in the United States versus the rest of the world and the impact that it might have on employment. And if anything, I would say I'm a little more cautious on corporate tax increases than I am on increasing taxes and the economic implications of it on higher income earners. Okay, we got just one little itty bitty segment left with Nathan Sheets. During the break, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. Check out some of our resources there. You know, it's under this very aptly named vertical called resources. Get it? Isn't that fabulous? Jill on Money, we'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we finish up with Nathan Sheets, he's an economist. We're talking about how stimulus should be focused. Who needs help most? So here's the rest of our interview with economist Nathan Sheets. What's more important, having an extra four, five, six hundred dollars a week for individuals or propping up some specific business sectors, whether it be airlines, hotels, or even small businesses. Talk about the trade-offs about doing one versus the other. Ideally, we'd do some of both in that the way I look at it is the households are the source of demand in the economy that will uh, keep the corporates and the firms going. The corporates are the source of jobs and employment that allow the households to have resources to spend. So there's a critical interlinkage between the two. But I think in this environment, if we have to choose, particularly during a time of stress like we're in now, I think what you want to do is get the money as quickly and directly to those who are going to need it. And that's the households that need to put food on the table. They need Mm -hmm. to to pay their bills. Tell me the trade-off between putting the money directly into the companies and versus putting the money directly into the people impacted by the companies getting smaller or going out of business. Another risk if we have industries fail or small businesses fail is that we hope at least with the vaccine, I expect over the next, let's say six to 12 months, the U.S. economy is going to uh, continue to rebound. And during that period, there will be increased demand for airline services and other goods and services in the economy. To the extent that these firms have failed, our capacity to be able to produce those goods and services is going to be more limited. So what we're trying to do for the corporate sector and for the small firms is to build a bridge across this this chasm that's been created by COVID so that then on the other side, they can produce and generate jobs and meet the needs of of consumers. So the loss is that we have a less uh, productive economy on the other side that's less capable of meeting the needs of, of our citizens. All right, that's it. That's the program. Thank you so much for listening. And if you've got a question throughout the week, you can always send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Don't forget to wash your hands, wear your masks, maintain your physical distancing, and do something nice for someone else today. We'll talk to you next week.